Okay, we'll get started. So thank you once again for coming out on a wet, windy, wild Sunday afternoon. Appreciate it. Um, my name's Andrew Smith and uh, I'm one of the Trinity who are organising this. There's Peter and George over here. Peter and George are going to be taking today's session on uh, the problem of suffering and evil. As you can see, a um, rather contentious issue, not only amongst Christians, but um, uh, one that atheists and uh, whatnot tend to plug quite um, often as a slam dunk argument against Christianity. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what we come up with. There'll be time for questions afterwards. So just a reminder that the next session will be on September the 28th, uh, here again, 3.30, and it's on how do we know the New Testament is reliable. And a Professor David Richmond uh, Professor Emeritus, I believe, of the University of Auckland. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Peter. And oh, I'm actually going first. And, uh, no, I won't. I'll hand over to George. <laughs> um, anyway, let's get started. And uh, when I first began to look at the subject, it was very much from an academic point of view. Uh, since then, I have done my apprenticeship in suffering. And so I can look at it from a practical point of view. One of the problems is that when people like to use suffering as an argument against God's existence, they forget all the other arguments about the existence of God. Some of those we covered last week. Um, so it's important to keep the whole picture in mind. A common reaction is if God created the world, why couldn't he have created a world without suffering and evil? How can he be a God of love? And I guess it's not just the existence of suffering that causes problems, it's the amount, and sometimes what appears to be an unfair distribution of it. And this raises the question of how much is too much? Some people say, well, why does suffering happen to good people? Well, one answer to that is none of us really is good. Right? We may feel we're better than the other person, but all of us have problems in that department. Even though we're made in the image of God, that image has become tarnished. Though, of course, we still have the problem about innocent children suffering. And the other thing, too, about evil is that although we see evil externally, we know about it internally. We have problems with the sort of people we are. So when people talk about evil, they sometimes forget to look inwardly because some of it is there. If you don't believe in God, then, of course, you don't have a problem in arguing about suffering, except how do you cope with it when it comes? And atheism, atheism provides no consolation, only extinction. Augustine argued that if there is a God, why is there so much evil? If there is no God, why is there so much good? In other words, if you're going to talk about evil, you've got to talk about good. And in fact, good and evil are not really opposites. You see, Evil is the absence of good, same as darkness is the absence of light, and cold is the absence of heat. So we must take into account that good exists. And if good exists, and we believe it exists, then we are into the realm of morality. And therefore that raises the question, why should we know that good exists? And so we come back to the whole question of moral law, which I talked about very briefly last time. If there's a moral law, then there's a moral lawgiver. And so what happens is that when people argue from evil to challenge God's existence, there is a problem of the question of where did good and evil come from. And if we say that God is unjust, where do we get the idea of justice from? We need to explain the source of our notions of evil and justice. And the philosopher Platinger argues that if we really believe in wickedness, then we have a powerful argument for God's existence. Of course, immediately we get into the moral question. And so we need to be on the defence. The atheist can be on the defence to explain why he thinks this thing is actually evil. C.S. Lewis raised an interesting problem. He says that the universe is so bad, or even half so bad, how on earth did humans ever come to attribute it to the activity of a wise and good creator? How is it we look out in the world and yet we believe that there is a wise God who cares about us? Where did that come from? And of course, 
when we look at the, the universe, people see it as a cold and hostile place, where it's the survival of the fittest. So again, we were reminded, we, how did Christianity come into being if that's what we see around us? Now, one of the things we've got to remember is that in Isaiah, it's in Isaiah 55, it speaks about my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways higher than your ways. And so, you know, we don't really understand how God works. He may have a higher purpose that we don't understand. And this is particularly true if life continues after death. That's when injustices can be righted and God can make up for the suffering in this life. Some would argue that God allows unnecessary suffering or excessive evil times. And admittedly, sometimes suffering does seem pointless. And dealing with this particular problem, I want to just make four points. First of all, unnecessary suffering is something impossible for us to know. We don't know what is unnecessary. Part of the problem is that some physical evil is a product of good things. For example, you have rain and hot and cold air are all necessary for, for life, and it's a good process, but another product is a tornado. And again, food is good to eat, but we can also get food poisoning. And so there's always the bad side, if you like, of the good things. If God removed the worst suffering from the world, then we'd, we'd go down to the next one and say, OK, that's the worst suffering. I don't like that either. So, okay, we move that one, we go down to this one, oh, the suffering. When do you stop? If you remove all of it, you run into the problem of free will, which I'll talk about in a little while longer, in a little while later. Pain also has a positive role. We know that if we put our hands on a, on a hot stove, we know all about it, don't we? It's there to protect us, to remind us that we are human. And the same nervous system that gives us pain gives us pleasure. That the whole system of where nerves are in our body is quite amazing. They're sort of very close together, the nerves and the places that matter, like in our tongue, where some of our internal organs, you can cut them up and you never feel anything. It's the way our bodies are designed. So you can't really appreciate joy without knowing pain and suffering. Now, there are a couple of philosophical arguments, and I want to um, skate through this pretty really quickly, because Peter's going to talk about some philosophical things, and it's a big topic, there's been a lot of debate, you can imagine the question of suffering has been argued about for centuries. And so I'm just going to skate over a few things, but I'm going to mention two questions that are on the notes there. If God is omnipotent, why didn't he make the best possible world? And secondly, if God is omnipotent and all good, then he could destroy evil because he's omnipotent, and he would destroy evil because he's all good. Now being omnipotent doesn't mean to say that God can do everything. See, God can make a square circle. He can't make something so big he can't lift it. God can't do things which don't make sense. He can't do things which are self-contradictory. And Aquinas says it's more appropriate to say such things cannot be done than God cannot do them. And if God is all goodness, then God is also just. And we believe in justice as we're made in the image of God. We can't separate goodness and justice. What do we mean by the best possible world? Best for whom? I think a world with free will and suffering has some positives, and I'll enlarge on that later. It's not easy to define the best possible world because we've all got different views. I mean, trying to compare two different worlds would be like trying to compare two great pieces of music. You just can't do that. They are different. If we still want to use the word best, then one way of talking about it is to say that this type of world is the best possible way to achieve the best possible world. We've not arrived there yet. It can't be the best possible world because it depends on us. And we're not great, are we? And so therefore, the world can't be the best possible while we're in it. And so therefore, this is the way one way God is moving towards the best possible world. And we are told that there will be a new world, a new heaven and a new earth without evil, pain, tears or death. We read that in Revelation 21. And Nancy, who's written a book about suffering, he's written a number of very good books, and um, Where Was God Without It Hurts is the book in particular, he talks about the fact that it's very difficult to create a superior, superior world where you've got natural laws and you've got free will. 
It makes it very difficult. And anybody who's an engineer who has to design something know that we often sometimes compromise. For example, it might be in the vehicle, it might be weight versus strength and light. So, sorry, I got it wrong. Lightness to make it efficient, weight for strength. And so often if you build something, you've got to compromise. And so therefore God had this problem of developing a world which had the natural laws and also free will. If God is going to make a creature like us, what is the most perfect way he would do it? Surely he'd want to make a creature that freely loved him. He could make us love him, and then we'd just be puppets. That would be less than perfect. So one answer to the philosophical questions is, God made everything perfect. One of the perfect things that God made was a world of free creatures. Free will can cause evil. Hence, evil are going to arise from the perfect. God made evil possible, but we as creatures made it actual. So evil is not something that God created, but it's the absence of good. So one answer to the question about God destroying evil is as follows. If God is all good, he would destroy evil. If God is omnipotent, that's all powerful, he could destroy evil. But evil is not destroyed. Yeah, we don't say then God does not exist. We say, hence God will one day destroy evil. And that's how we finish that argument. So, one could argue, following Augustine, that God may allow evil because he can bring good out of evil. And evil cannot be destroyed at present without destroying free will. However, evil could eventually be destroyed if we go beyond the grave. Okay, what about free will? Well, that's a whole new topic. Does free will exist? Well, that's for another day. That gets involved with materialism and a whole range of things. Um, I'm going to assume we have free will. I think most people sense that we are free to do things. We have some freedom, is what I've written on the notes. What does that mean? Well, I think to some extent, the way we behave and the way we decide things is very much determined by our natures, by our, our nurture and our nature through circumstances. And so my wife knows me pretty well, and if I had to make a decision, she'd have a pretty good idea which way I'd go, because she knows me well. There is a sense in which... We don't have as much freedom as we think we have. A lot of it is predetermined by who we are. But we still are responsible for our own decisions, and we see that clearly in the Bible. And what does this freedom mean? We're free to hurt ourselves. We, we're, we can do things that are bad for our minds and our bodies. If we read junk material, our minds become junk. If we eat junk food, our bodies become junk. And we become slave to bad habits. And a lot of suffering actually is self-induced. Often our bodies give us a warning, and we ignore it. We take risks and wonder why accidents happen to us. And the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms and Proverbs, has many passages that warn about the painful consequences of wrong actions. If you do things wrong, there's a consequence. There's a deeper aspect of freedom I want to say something about, and I, I did cover it last time, but I talked about epigenetics. And nobody took me up on that. And epigenetics is more, it means bigger than genetics. Epi is a Greek word for more. And what it, what it means, epigenetics, is that things, genes can get switched on and off. They can get switched on by the things we do, by circumstances. And what's really interesting and very different from thinking in the past is that these sort of things can also be inherited. In other words, our parents can do things which are, are not good for us when we're born and things can be switched on and therefore when we talk about the verse the sins of the fathers you know are on the third and fourth generation of children I can see that makes sense now from this new ideas of genetics so we find then that, that more there are more things caused by human freedom than we realize it could be that some of the problems we have with, with genes not doing very well or, or defects can be brought on by a change of circumstances. I, I know, for example, that I've got a gene which gives me ankylosing spondylitis, which is a rare arthritic disease, which I've fought all my life. And I managed very well with that, and I used to be very flexible. I used to be a gymnast and do things. My first wife became very ill, and then she eventually died after a six-year struggle with cancer. And somehow or other, this disease got going. 
it's almost so it was triggered. And so I've been fighting it ever since. I've since had both knees and both hips replaced, that's by the way. Um, so this is the sort of thing, things can get switched on and we don't realise it. And so a lot of things are caused by ourselves. We're also free to hurt others. You know, um, in a world of free will there's going to be conflict. It's inevitable. And because of the solidarity of the human race, race we can do nothing in isolation. Somehow or other we're all connected. And when one person is affected, the common good seems to be spread. The common evil is the same. And I'm seeing, I'm a trained counsellor, and I see breakdown of personal relationships happening all the time. It's almost an epidemic of it. I meet in the counselling room. We can hurt others by careless behaviour. I mean, smoking, for example, we know is bad in terms of, of, of side street. Um, all sorts of things we do can affect others. For example, shiny buildings fall down with earthquakes, and of course we've had that in Christchurch. Um, and unhygienic practices can, can cause it to pick up nasty bugs. And of course we've had superbugs. I've had one, and nearly died. Um, so superbugs are around, and so these, all these things are available. Sometimes aid's not provided in time for a disaster. They had trouble with Haiti getting um, help in there uh, after, the, um, after the earthquake. And we can mess up our environment. We can cause pain for other people. Like removing removal of forests causes all kinds of erosion. And the removal of wetlands causes problems with flooding, as we've seen in many parts of the world. Our environment can physically stress us. We get noise pollution, pollution of our air, water and food, spiritual pollution through advertising, where the media in there try to make us dissatisfied with how we look, with what we own, where we live, and so on. So, we are free then to hurt other people. We're also free to ignore God. And if we do this, I believe we hurt ourselves the most, at the very depths of our being. We can't ignore God, the claims of God in our lives. If we do, we may not have any peace. And I believe that our destiny is to worship God, and when we push Him away, we're going against what we are created for. The consequences of our freedoms are as far as in particular we need to have an impartial world. If you and I are going to be free, the world's going to treat us the same way. So I want to shoot you, my gun doesn't turn into a banana. Um, the thing is that God's not going to intervene every time there is a problem. But problems will arise because of the neutral environment. And so if God was going to intervene, if he kept on intervening, we wouldn't know where we were. We couldn't live. Our life, the whole world would be in chaos because there's no consistency. Somehow or other, we live in a consistent world. We live in a consistent world because it's created by God. For example, if I tell a lie, should there be any harmful consequences? Should there be some response to that? In fact, one of the most important things, as one philosopher says, is that the capacity of love will never be developed except in a very limited sense of the, of the word, in a world in which there's no such thing as suffering. So with every negative thing, there is a positive thing. And love grows through sharing in times of difficulty. So, all right, the world has to be a consistent place, and it has to be a neutral place. And it has to be neutral for several reasons. One is that if we are free to worship God, the world should be neutral in some respect as to, how, as to God revealing himself. There is a sense in which God is almost in the shadows. Those that submit themselves to God see signs of a divine presence, while those that don't see only destruction. In other words, in a sense, the world is neutral, although there are verses in, in Romans 1.26 that speaks about the things we see of God has made and so on. What, we, what we're seeing here is that God has made, made us so that he is neutral with regard to whether we recognise God or not. If we don't recognise God, we don't see anything. If we recognise God, we do. What about natural disasters? This is always the one which causes a lot of problem. The previous arguments have been to do with moral evil, that is evil arising from moral decisions. And I've seen, have said that a lot of this is more than we think. Even genetic things can be caused by moral decisions. So I want to look at now the question of natural disasters. And we think about earthquakes and tornadoes. And of course, some of these things happen 
through uh, what, what people do. If, as I say, if we are going to pollute our atmosphere and cause global warming, and then we're going to have strange weather patterns. In fact, what happens is with, when the overall average temperature starts to increase, you get instability in the weather, and we get floods, and we get all sorts of things happening. So some of what we call natural evil or natural disasters are actually caused by us. And there are some sort of diseases and viruses which contribute to the total ecosystem in ways we don't understand. The majority of viruses are all good for us. Thousands of them, and there are just a few that, that aren't. So human influence is a big factor in disasters. You know, a fire can break out because there's no proper uh, sprinkler system, as we heard about a, a, a couple that lost four children overseas. Um, buildings and bridges collapse through earthquakes because of inadequate building practices. Inadequate roads lead to motor vehicle accidents and so on. A key aspect of all this is the second law of thermodynamics, which I talked very briefly about last time. I'd love to spend more time on it, but I don't have that. And the way I interpret the law is that everything falls to bits sooner or later. What it means is that the world is running out of energy. And I have that problem every morning when I get out of bed. Um, what it says is that everything is tending to become random. If you've got something that's structured, it eventually tends to collapse and it tends to crumble and end up being completely spread out. It, it's like, for example, you've got a dam. Up here, you've got water, and down here, you've got the river. Now, because it's up there, it's got what we call potential energy. It's got energy that can be used. And as it comes down, the kinetic energy turns the turbines, produces electricity, then the water runs out, and then eventually it dissipates. And that energy is gone. The energy that's turned into electricity then goes off to people, and of course, then we use it up. And so that energy that was there gets spread out. So we lose it. And that's what's happening. We are losing energy. The sun is actually burning out in a few billion years, of course. Uh, is there a joke which says, oh, I thought you said a few million. Oh, I feel better now. <laughs> um, anyway, everything falls a bit sooner or later. And of course, we are formed a bit too. I don't need to remind you of that. And uh, <clears throat> I've been well aware of that for a number of years. The world is also breaking down at a macroscopic, that's a, a grand, big level. For example, your back fence falls over because of erosion and your drains blocked because of silting or tree roots. These can't be called acts of God. Erosion and silting are part of the levelling out process. Earthquakes are part of the process of evening out stresses in the world's crust. The world is also breaking down at a microscopic level. Genes and chromosomes of accidents too. Genes get switched on and off. These accidents are called mutations, and they usually occur through environmental changes. They're usually harmful, and we can pass some of them on to our children. So we see then that the nature of the world leads to all kinds of suffering. Natural disasters, accidents, sickness, and genetic damage. But we must keep things in perspective, because disasters upset us not because they're painful, but because they're generally exceptional. You see, people wake up most days feeling good, well, some do anyway, um, unless you're starving or recovering from an earthquake. Most illnesses are treatable, if you have access to medical treatment. Most planes take off and land without mishap. The accident, the injury and the tumour are life-shattering, but they're generally rare. It's not much comfort to be told you're going through a rare event. I appreciate that. But it's because they are in our focus that we often forget the goodness that we have in our lives. What's a biblical perspective? Well, again, this is a whole theological thing which if you take off in a different whole topic. So I'm actually going to skate through this very quickly. Um, we are told that we live in a fallen world. Okay? Why is the world like this? It could be argued it's God's way of producing a theologically neutral and dynamic, dynamic environment where meaning must be sought. But we are told that the world is not as it should be. Somehow or other, the ground and the animals became cursed. And although we don't know what the world is like outside the Garden of Eden, because eventually they were expelled from the Garden, all sorts of things have crept into our world to deflect it from its original purpose. A well-known um, writer called McGrath says, This is a good world gone wrong, yet which retains the memory of what it once was and the hope of what it will finally become. It is like a country that has been invaded by an occupying force 
which recalls its day of freedom in the past and equally awaits its liberation in the future. The presence of suffering was not meant to be a permanent feature. Then I could go on about the Bible and about spiritual background. I'm not going to do that. There's a lot there about the Old Testament. I'll say one thing, that Jesus seemed to regard evil as almost an inevitable part of creation and didn't find it necessary to offer explanations for its presence in the world. We read that Satan entered Judas and desired to have Peter as well. Satan also tempted Jesus in the wilderness, after which time Jesus began his ministry. And the role of Satan is discussed particularly in Revelation chapter 20. What I want to say in terms of, of this New Testament aspect is the world is to be restored. And Romans 8, Paul talks about the fact that the whole of creation is groaning, like the bondage of decay. But one day we'll be free as children of God. And the pain of creation is like the pain of childbirth. God will remove sorrow and make all things new. And the New Testament teaches that God's objective is to establish his kingdom on earth. There will be a new heaven and a new earth without suffering, death and predation in the future. What about other religions? Well, again, it's a whole new topic. <laughs> These are all big topics. Um, I'm going to just say a few things about it. In, contrary, in contradiction to many worldviews, Christianity accepts the reality of evil and suffering, and while giving some reasons for it and offering God's strength to endure it, it's real about it. Hinduism, for example, sees evil as an illusion. So the problem can't be dealt with since the problem is denied. It also blames suffering on a person's own actions, usually from a previous life. Evil and good are simply ignorance or unenlightened awareness, respectively. So the cruel actions of others are attributed to misunderstanding. And of course, Hinduism and Buddhism are dominated by reincarnation. I'll deal with that just, uh, just in a few moments. Islam sees suffering as either a test by Allah or the result of sin. Not much choice between the two when you're suffering. We find, summarising this big topic in a few lines, other religions tend to relieve a person's failures on their shoulders with little hope of becoming a better person. But in Christianity we have a God who reaches towards us and provides a way for salvation, provides forgiveness and the opportunity for us to know Him. Now there are some traditional answers that are given. If you're a materialist and don't believe there's anything but what you see, there's no explanation for suffering, only bad luck. For a religious person, there are a number of suggestions, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. One belief is that suffering is God's judgment. The Jews believed that if you suffered, it was because of God's judgment on you, your sin, or your parents' sin. And so, if you suffer with individuals, but with nations, Israel went through some hard times because of sin. Amos had a lot to say that Israel had become corrupt, and he had tried to warn them of judgment to come. The sins of our parents can affect us physically and psychologically. Today we see the same cause and effect. A father is an alcoholic and a wife beater. The last thing the son wants to be is to grow up like his father. And so his attention is focused on the behaviour of his father rather than positive behaviour. And as you tend to become what you focus on, the son then turns out to follow the same path with the same repercussions. And I see in counselling lots of intergenerational things that happen. We can therefore hurt our children by giving them our hang-ups, and that's where epigenetics can come in. Now, Jesus didn't agree with the Jewish approach in several places in the New Testament, and I won't go into texts there, but I'll give one example, which is an interesting one, about a man who was blind. And the disciples asked Jesus, you know, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? And Jesus said, neither. This man, because he's, he's blind, we're now going to see the power of God. In other words, there was a purpose to his blindness which the disciples missed. And that is, they were going to see the power of God to heal this man. Satan can afflict people. And again, there's, there's not, there are only a few verses about Satan in, in the Old Testament. There's, there's quite a few in the New Testament. Um, and Jesus occasionally referred to them. In Luke 16, he speaks about a daughter of Abraham being bound by Satan for 18 years. She had a problem. Also, Jesus told the paralyzed man he healed at the, the pool of Bethesda to sin no more, or something worse would happen to him. So obviously sin was at the door. 
of his suffering. He also told a woman caught in adultery much the same thing. The man let down from the roof from his four friends, and they cut a hole in the roof, I had to do it in my house, but they did it and through the roof. And Jesus, first of all, forgave his sins. So in those four examples, there's a connection between sin and suffering. But of course, it's not the main cause. Suffering can be caused by sin in our, in our past lives. Reincarnation. In other words, if you live a bad life, you may come back at something unpleasant like a mathematician. Um, <laughs> it's attractive belief and very popular. It's the outworking of bad karma, whatever that means. It's supposed to open up the opportunity for a second or third or fourth or so many chances. The number of problems with it first. Society doesn't seem to be getting any better, so it's not working. Secondly, if I'm suffering for something, and I don't know what that was for, how does it help me? If it's from a previous life that I don't know anything about. And then while it talks about um, suffering being caused by something previously, how do we get back to the first inequality? Because we know, according to science, the world had a beginning. So there was a beginning. So where do the inequalities come from to start with? Also, too, in pantheistic systems, which are like the, uh, the Hindus and the Buddhists, there's no moral standard for right and wrong. Karma is not a moral law. It's just a system of retribution with no fundamental guidelines to tell us what to do. Sin must be punished and cannot be forgiven, which is contrary to Christian grace. And then, of course, not much help with the suffering. In fact, the one thing I should say before I forget about karma if, for example, you believe in karma and believe in reincarnation, if you help somebody, that increases your karma, but it makes the other person's karma worse because they've still got to outwork their suffering. So if you make their life better, they, they, they have to suffer more. And so what happens is that this idea of reincarnation and karma leads to a fatalism, which means we just don't help people. It's Allah's will. This has happened. And that's where the big difference between Islam and Christianity is our view of, of suffering in particular, and sin, and there's others as well. That's another topic. Um, I'm going to very quickly now just finish with a few um, Old Testament responses, mainly because these four answer four questions. The first one was Joseph. He had a, a, a pretty rough life up to the time when eventually he became second in command. Um, because he was able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. He rose to this heights at the age of 30. That's fantastic. But he went through prison and all sorts of things. And right at the very end of his life, in Genesis 50 verse 20, when he's talking to his brothers, he said, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In other words, he could see that all he had been through was preparation for what God was going to do. Because God, through the operation of Joseph and through getting them through the famine. He not only cared for the people of Egypt, Egypt, but he cared for his 12 brothers and the Israelites. And of course, out of that came Jesus from the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, so he had a part to play, but he had to suffer for it. And Job was another one. Now, he suffered. He lost his, his family. He lost his, his uh, oxen, camels, I think, I've got what the animals were. His house fell down. Um, he, he was, suffered physically, and he complained against God, and he said, why have you allowed me to suffer? The answer was not because he was evil. It wasn't. He was a good man. But somehow or other, he was caught up in the conflict or description of God and Satan. And I think he was caught in the crossfire of what was going on. And at the very end, when he started to ask God questions, God basically said to him, look, this is, I'm a great creator, and he, he, God appears on the scene in chapter 38. There are 37 chapters before then, which tell you how he felt about it. In chapter 38, God comes in and says, Look, I'm a creator in this. You know, who are you to argue against me? Because if I you know I told you, you wouldn't understand. He didn't answer his questions about suffering. Not at all. But he blessed him all the same. He blessed him. And finally, David had a question about why is it that evil people get away with it? And he said in Psalm 73, when I went into the temple, I realized, in other words, in God's presence, I realized that they were on slippery grounds. 
He was looking at the end game. Okay, they may be doing all right now, but their end is destruction. And that provides, if you like, different answers to the questions that we have about suffering. And I've got a list of things, and I really need to, to finish now in the last couple of minutes. Some positive aspects of suffering. Suffering can wake us up. C.S. Lewis says it's a megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Sometimes we need a blast in our ear to say, hey, you know, I'm here. God is here. Wake up. It can also be a refining process to make us fit for God's kingdom. One philosopher called John Hick calls it soul making. And suffering can be a disciplinary process. In Genesis 12, uh, Genesis 12, Hebrews 12, it speaks about God chastises his children. Because he, in the same way that like a parent, we correct a child because the child is not going on the right path. In the same way God allows us to be corrected. But not all suffering comes from God to teach us a lesson. But it is possible that there is some suffering which is really God directing us and helping us. And it helps us develop character, teaches us um, perseverance, self-sacrifice. Because we allow children to stumble and fall while they're learning to walk, you know, they sort of lean against the walls and have that sort of maneuver along and then they fall over. But you allow them to learn. And God sometimes allows us to learn by allowing us to stumble. Suffering also removes any sense of reliance and pride. We're forced to rely on, on God's presence. I mean, Paul found this. You know, three times he prayed to God for God to remove this problem that he had. We don't know what it was. It could have been some kind of malarial thing that he had, but obviously it was pretty nasty. But he realized that God had given it to him for a purpose so that he may trust the grace of God. And then suffering provides us with an internal perspective. Our real citizenship, it talks about that again in, in the New Testament, our real citizenship is in heaven. And so we're only here for a certain amount of time, and a short time really. Suffering can be for God's glory. When we are healed, or when God guides us, we can praise God. And for example, I, I survived uh, the superbug, and I would have been dead in a week. This was about four and a half years ago. Lots of people were praying for me. And I came through it extremely well in the end. I had a heart valve replacement. It's a long story. But I survived, and I realized something that, okay, I've survived to serve. That was the lesson that I learned from that. And so it is important that we give God the glory. Sometimes we can't see God acting directly, but when we look back we see, yes, God had a hand in this. He was moving things along, and I hadn't really realized at the time, but I can see it now. And suffering can be for God's glory. Suffering can help develop an empathy within us for others who suffer. That's why I'm a counselor now. I've been counseling for 11 years, because this is one of the things I like to do. I like to get alongside people and walk with them. God doesn't waste suffering. We shouldn't waste it either. And when suffering comes, instead of asking, why has this happened to me? We can ask, what have I learned? Instead of asking, what is the meaning of all this? We can say, what meaning can I give to this? And Viktor Frankl, you may have heard of him, he was a Jewish psychiatrist that was in a prison war camp and suffered greatly. And he made the following insightful comment. Man is ready and willing to shoulder any suffering as soon as, long as he can see a meaning in it. We can see a meaning in our suffering, then it helps us to keep going. And I finish with these words. The first thing for Christians to realize is that God understands when we suffer. You know, the Bible teaches us that Jesus emptied himself, humbled himself, and died on a cross. He became flesh and subject to the forces of nature, hunger, thirst, suffering, and fulfilling the role of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 when he was crucified. And in a mysterious way, God experienced suffering through Jesus, and the death of Jesus is the greatest example of unjustified suffering, the suffering of a totally innocent man. And he transformed suffering, wonder, uh, suffering into something wonderful for the benefit of all mankind, and as it became part of our redemption and leads to our future resurrection. In the same way, our suffering can be transformed and used for the benefit of all that we can come in contact with. God doesn't necessarily remove suffering, but gets alongside us and comforts us so that we can be so that we can comfort others. Interesting, and I'll finish with this because it's an interesting comment which I only just saw recently. 
When Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, he said to Paul, why are you persecuting me? Indicating that Jesus still suffered when his people suffered through Paul's persecution of them. So in some way which is mysterious, God, although he doesn't necessarily take away our suffering, he can walk with us in our suffering. Thank you. Thank you.